Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. We'll be getting started in just a few moments. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Virtual Meetings and Ephemeral Messages, Thinking About Preservation, Discovery, and Sanctions for Loss. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Florida Bar's Standing Committee on Technology and Legal Fuel, the Practice Resource Center of the Florida Bar. This will be the first in a series of monthly webinars we'll be hosting along with the Standing Committee on Technology, leading up to our annual All-Day Technology Seminar, which is scheduled to take place in conjunction with the annual Florida Bar Convention in June. The details of these upcoming webinars and the All-Day Technology Seminar will be posted to LegalFuel.com as they become available. So please be sure to visit LegalFuel.com for those updates. Before we get started, I'd like to over, go over a few housekeeping items. We will be recording this webinar and we'll share the link after the event. The recording and any supporting resources will also be posted to our website, legalfuel.com. Any questions you may have during today's presentation can be asked through the Q&A feature. You will find the Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom control panel. Our presenters will do their best to answer any questions you have. However, due to time constraints, they non may not be able to address them all. Today's presentation has been approved by the Florida Bar for one hour of general CLE and one hour of technology. The course number for today is 4473. I'd now like to introduce today's presenters. Ron Hedges is a senior counsel with Denton's. He served as a United States Magistrate Judge in the District of New Jersey from 1986 to 2017. Ron is a frequent writer and speaker on various topics related to, among other things, electronic information and is the lead author of Managing Discovery of Electronic Information, a Pocket Guide for Judges, third edition. He is also the co-senior editor of the Sedona Conference Co Cooperation Proclamation, Resources for the Judiciary, third edition. The Honorable Gisela Cardone Eli is a senior judge with the 11th Judicial Circuit. Among other things, Judge Eli was a member of the Florida Conference of Circuit Judges and a chair of that conference. She is a graduate of Barry University and the University of Miami School of Law. And I'll now hand it over to our presenters, Ron and Judge Eli, or Cardone Eli, and enjoy the show. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And thank you to the Florida Bar for letting us present today. If we can go to our slides, Jonathan. Sure. One second. Okay. Can you explain that I will be shutting the video and the mute while you're talking and then I'll come back in when um, matters are pertinent to Florida um, rules of procedure and so forth, okay? I think you just, just explained it to everyone, Judge, so thank you. Thank you. This is what we're talking about today, as you can see. Let's go to slide number two. This is Judge Ely, Senior Judge in the 11th Judicial Circuit sitting in Miami past chair of the Florida Conference of Circuit Judges. If we can go to the next slide, Jonathan. Uh, this is me. You heard me describe before. In addition to everything else, I sat on the federal bench for over 20 years in New Jersey as a magistrate judge. And you'll see as you look at this, there are a number of tech-related things I've written about and I'm involved with. And with that, let's go forward to the next slide. Disclaimer that I need to give. This information we're giving today is not legal advice. Please don't consider it to be. This represents personal opinions of the presenters only. 
and it's being offered for informational and educational purposes only. And with that, let's go forward, if we could. And let's talk about what we're going to be talking about today. We are obviously in the midst of a pandemic. And that pandemic has brought to the forefront of the profession and every other business and a lot of personal events, virtual meeting platforms and ephemeral messaging apps. And obviously we're on a virtual meeting platform now. So we're gonna be talking about what those platforms are, what ephemeral messaging apps are. We're gonna talk about the content of meetings and messages, how those might deemed to be business records or subject to a duty to retain imposed by regulation or the like. And then we're gonna to turn to the common law, talk about duty to preserve arising for virtual meetings or ephemeral messages and sanctions that might be imposed. And those of you who might've been listening at the beginning, I am going to be opening a topic, generally speaking about preservation and the like. And then Judge Ely is going to come in and talk about some specifics with regard to Florida. So with that, we can go to the next slide, Jonathan. And I apologize all of you, I'm having a little trouble loading these slides and advancing them myself. So very simple definition of virtual meetings. We're talking about software. That's what enabling is enabling everything to be done. Bring people together over the internet, usually video, video conferencing, such as we have now chat tools, reaction, screen sharing, and the like, such as we have now. And you see some examples being given, the biggest one being Zoom. And for our purposes, I think what we as lawyers should be thinking about, if we or our clients are using virtual meetings to communicate, such as we're doing now, what does that mean for the practice of law for us? And what does it mean about obligations that might be imposed? And in addition to that, what it might mean for discovery purposes. So we're gonna do a general introduction to all this today. When we get to the end of the presentation, we'll provide a couple slides with some resources that you might be able to find or you might find useful. And Judge, before we go any further, any opening comments from you on Florida law? Florida law, as all of you know, and first of all, thank you to the Florida Bar for inviting me. Florida law, as you very well know, follows basically a lot of the federal rules of procedure. And with reference to this program, there is basically one and only one area in the evidence code that addresses the preservation or addresses ESI, which is as you know, electronically stored information, which is the area that we're talking about today. And very specifically, ephemeral information. Things that exist for a brief moment in time and then do not fail, don't exist any longer. And as, as the years go on, things have gotten more and more complex. The law, as you will find out in your practice, is almost never up to date with technology, ever. The last time that the Florida Evidence Code was amended was 2012. And the amendment, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but eight years, nine years now in technology is, is almost going back to the time of, of the dinosaurs. So, my suggestion is always going to be go to the text, go to the text of the evidence code, go to the text of whatever cases exist. And there's not a lot of case law in this world in the state of Florida. So then we have to go to common law. And since there's very little case law involved and the rules of evidence are quite a bit behind in the technology world, you just have to extrapolate and basically use your creative minds and legal legal skills. Okay, thank you, Judge. If we can go to the next slide, Jonathan. Yes. 
Before we talk about records and a duty to retain, I just want to mention a couple other things for you. We're not talking ethics today, but understand that everything the judge just mentioned and what we're gonna be talking about later on are gonna implicate some ethical obligations that we as lawyers have. The duty of competence. Obviously, if we're going to be advising a client or conducting discovery into virtual meetings or into ephemeral messaging, we have to understand what those are so we can understand what we're asking for, what's there, and deal with what we get. There's also a question of confidentiality. There may be communications going back and forth that we may think are ephemeral that may not be. We'll look at that later. And we have to appreciate the obligations we have to maintain our clients' confidences when we communicate. And something else to think about, again, beyond the scope of this per se, but we as lawyers need to be concerned about this, and that's the duty to supervise. So understand if we are retaining a service to conduct virtual meetings for us, or we're using a instant messaging platform or an ephemeral messaging platform, we can't control the ephemeral messaging platform with some exceptions, but certainly depending on whoever is recording the virtual meetings, we may have obligations to supervise what's being done and how that's done. We'll leave that for another day. But business records and the duty to retain. Pretty simple and straightforward. You see what a record is. It's documentary evidence of a business process. I think it's fair to say that if we are having a virtual meeting on behalf of an organization, or for example, this meeting today, it might be a record. However, the Florida, the, the Florida Bar defines it or how it might be defined elsewhere. Uh, remember now that a record is not a document. So when you're thinking of litigation, we're not thinking per se of records. We're thinking of documents that may be preserved, may be produced, maybe moved into evidence, and the judge mentioned the Florida evidence rules a while ago. And then, again, document may be broader than record and subject to preservation and production. And here's a decision that came out of Tennessee a little while ago talking about preservation of text messages. And again, as Judge Ely mentioned, we're going to be looking at broad principles. There's not too much out there by way of rules that specifically address ephemeral messaging, and virtual platforms. And last, look at the last bullet point, something to take in mind when you're dealing with a client or perhaps for some larger discussion. There may be concerns about keeping things that are not records because organizations don't want to become inundated with electronic paper, for lack of a better phrase, and concerned about spoliation of information that might be kept when it doesn't have to be kept. So some basic things to keep in mind. Number one, if you're dealing with an organization or for your own purposes as a law firm, are you defining virtual meetings and ephemeral communications as records? What does that mean for your organization if you're doing it? Distinguish between a record, however we define that, any document that may come into your organization, your client's organization. Realize that document and record aren't the same thing. There may be obligations imposed with regard to either. And last, we have these, quote, non-records, close quote. And we're going to look at that a little bit in the context of ephemeral messaging and perhaps even in virtual messages, where we may not consider this to be a record, but it may be something that has to be kept or is kept informally. And how do we deal with that and how to tell our clients or suggest to our clients how to deal with it? Yes, and, Judge. And, and in Florida, many of you are involved in representing um, government lawyers or government entities. Uh, you already know that Florida has a very, very wide ranging public records uh, government in the sunshine. And that has an entirely uh, adds another layer of requirements to the preservation. For example, in the local newspaper, uh, Daily Business Review, there was a headline in the last day or so that to Zoom or not to Zoom, and there is an objection by a 
lawyer representing um, a citizen, I believe, that the zoning um, meeting does not meet, uh, that the virtual zoning meeting is illegal under Florida records law. So there are, for example, we do, as you know now, um, courthouses are still unfortunately closed. So all of our litigation is done on Zoom or other platforms, mostly Zoom, we use Zoom and those, those have to be open to the public. So we have to constantly update and publish the meeting phone numbers or meeting um, whatever it is that the phone numbers are for the different divisions. In the criminal division, we have 24 different divisions and 24 numbers to publish. And, and in addition to that, we have two different divisions doing bond hearings. In civil, it is a similar case in juvenile. So we have dozens and dozens of, and every time I do a hearing, there's a lawyer who appears and apologizes profusely because they were in the wrong meeting room. So Florida, because of the public records law has a lot of different and far more stringent requirements when it comes to open meetings. And thank you, Judge. Let's go to the next slide. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm going to be giving you some general principles and Judge Ely is going to be talking specifics about Florida. And remember, I was a federal judge so I'm going to be looking at the federal rules of civil procedure a lot. This is the scope of discovery, some sense, with regard to what you can get under the federal rules. I can request from you, inspect, copy, test, sample, certain things within possession, custody, or control. So the first thing we need to think about in litigation, if there is a virtual meeting out there somewhere, content, or an ephemeral message, how do I go about getting it? We're not going to go into the details of possession, custody, control. Generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that I would serve a request on an adversary. Say, give me the content of this Zoom meeting. Give me these ephemeral messaging. And then the other side would have to come back to me and say, we don't have possession, custody, control over it. It's with X. It's with Zoom or whatever. We'll leave that one aside. Just something for you to think about. Next slide, please. Now, this is the scope of discovery under the federal rules of civil procedure. Anything not privileged, relevant to a claim or defense, and proportional to the needs of the case. And you'll see the little language on the bottom. It doesn't have to be admissible to be discoverable. What this means, as far as we're concerned, is that, for example, if there was a virtual meeting taking place that though 10 of us were in, and we wound up discussing something related to a contract, or perhaps we had a discussion about some business activity we were going to be conducting. That contract, that business activity, and any discussions about it may be relevant to a claim or defense and may be discoverable. Pretty simple and straightforward. Same thing with content of virtual, I'm sorry, of ephemeral communications. If it's relevant to a claim or defense, you get it under the federal rules, subject to the proportionality obligations that are imposed in this rule now. This language came in in 2015, amendments to the federal rules of civil procedure. Very important centerpiece in discovery. Even though it's relevant, there are arguments to be made that it's not discoverable. For our purposes, assuming that a party has possession, custody, or control over the content of an ephemeral content of ephemeral message or the content of a virtual meeting relevant to a claim or defense is discoverable subject to the producing party arguing, judge, it costs too much money or it's not worth it or the like, costs too much, too much time and expense to get. And that's the burden or expense. So that's just a basic background. Understand that content can be discoverable. And Joe, let's go to the next slide, please. Let me, let me, let me, let me take a look at what, let me take a look at what happened to Federal Rule 26 
when we basically adopted it in Florida, it is rule 1.280. And, and again, if you, I, I always say go to the text. And um, I learned that from a very fine colleague of mine in Maryland. What, what, is, what are the things that 1.280 talks about? 1.280 talks about documents. We think of documents as paper, contracts, usually documents or papers or, or books or things like that. It talks about things. Things I would say would be a cell phone. It talks about land entry on the land, which is interesting because that is a sacred concept. Uh, the, the supervision or the inspection of actual land. It talks about other properties. So anything else that is not any one of those things. And that's in section A. Section B says it talks about books, documents again, tangible things and it talks about persons it's interesting um persons i guess can be um evidence of i don't know what the 2012 amendment that i mentioned earlier for the first time addresses electronically stored information esi and in there we adopted the concept and the review of esi with a view at looking at proportionality. How much is it going to cost to send someone to go and review a hard drive that may contain millions, millions of pages? Um, we used to have warehouses full of paper and the little, I had a case that dealt with litigation in New York and the lawyers came into court in Miami and brought pictures, and this is the day before cell phone cameras, but they had eight by 10 pictures showing that they were in this dark, dusty room with no air conditioning and obviously dust and mold or they allege all kinds of things. So I said, that's, that's, that's not reasonable. And then 2012, um, the amendment also talks, in addition to proportionality in terms of amount, it talks about the reasonableness. Now, it talks about sampling, and sampling is a very interesting concept that, and you know what sampling is. Sampling is basically, instead of having to review a million pages of documents, one of the parties requests, give, give me 10,000 pages and I will look at it and I am going to believe that the 10,000 medical record billing pages are going to give me an idea of what you did with the other 9 million pages. So that's what happened to federal rule 26 in the state of Florida rules of procedure, which is um, the only one that we have to deal with. So. Thank you, Judge. Let's go to the next slide, Jonathan. This is just an order, protective order, if you will, to limit the scope of discovery. You have to make a showing of good cause. And if the motion is denied, the court can order discovery. So the basic layout under the federal rules and the state rules, and let's go to the next slide, Jonathan, and talk about this basic idea. Here's how we talk about content. And we can talk about this for the purposes of virtual meetings. And we can also talk about it for the purpose of ephemeral messaging. Because if we don't keep it as a record or preserve it, it's gone. So some questions you want to ask. Is the content relevant to a claim or defense? I mentioned this before in the context of a meeting I might have or a communication I might have. Is it non-privileged? Because remember, you don't get discovery of privileged information. Is discovery proportional to the needs of the case? Does the party you want it from have possession, custody, or control over it? And then after that, if there's no possession, custody, or control, do we need a subpoena to get it? These are the contours of discovery. So let's put this within the scope of virtual meetings first. Jonathan, if we go to the next slide. <clears throat> 
Ephemeral communications obviously are not the same as virtual meetings. Although in the sense they could be because if you don't make a record of the virtual meeting, it's gone. First thing to think about is whether something is actually ephemeral or not. This is the settlement between the FTC and Snapchat, oh, five years ago or so. Snapchat basically said, we get rid of stuff, we don't keep it. You see the first paragraph, and this is a settlement between the FTC and Snapchat, said it would disappear forever after a time period expired. And then there's a complaint that the FTC files that say recipients can save snaps indefinitely. And if you go down later on, You'll see the magic language for an FTC settlement. Snapchat continued to misrepresent that the sender controls how long a recipient can view a snap. So the first thing to think about whenever we're dealing with either virtual messages or ephemeral communications is whether it's something that actually is ephemeral or is it stored? And we'll get a chance to look at what stored means later on if we have time to do that. But when you're in litigation and you're serving a request on someone, if you requested preservation of virtual meeting content or the like, and remember the duty to preserve attaches when litigation is known of or when it's reasonably anticipated, there may be an obligation to preserve content of virtual meetings. There also may be an obligation to preserve ephemeral communications, assuming you can. So when an argument is being advanced, we don't have it, it's ephemeral. One of the first things I think that needs to be asked if I'm a requesting party is, is it really ephemeral? What is it? And then once I've answered that question, I think the next question needs to be asked, and this settlement with the FTC and the Snapchat gives you a good idea about that, what settings are available? to whoever was communicating or conducting a meeting, what were the settings set to be? If the settings were set to keep things for two or three weeks, maybe that's ephemeral in the long term, but it certainly means it was there at some point, and if the duty to preserve attached while that document was preserved, presumably it has to be preserved. So that's the first thing I think we get out of this today. Number one, Assuming that the content of a virtual meeting or an ephemeral communication is relevant and discoverable, is there a way to keep it? If there was a way to keep it, did the duty preserve attached attach before it was gotten rid of? And this may also be important because it may bear on the question of intent. And under the federal rules of civil procedure, this is rule 37E. We'll take a look at a case later that talks about that a showing a specific intent to get rid of information of ESI may be relevant to the nature of a sanction that may be imposed against the party that didn't keep it and preserve it. And Judge, I don't know if you have any thoughts about what's, whether something is really ephemeral or not. Well, I think we're talking about that Hulu case um, uh, and, and, and Herzog case rather where the company decided to change the system from it was able to preserve whatever the content was to all of a sudden make it an ephemeral. That is a really bad idea because once you change it, then you have scienter and you have intent. And um, again, if, if there was no duty to preserve, it doesn't really matter. Um, I don't know if you plan to talk about the concept of triggers that require preservation where um, there, there was none before. And I, I, I had a question for you. Are, are there any federal um, statutes or laws that require preservation of certain things? There are, for example, in the securities field, you have to record, you have to record communications or you have to record purchases or buys or whatever. It's an easy way to describe it. Remember I mentioned before that there's a question of a duty to retain as opposed to a duty to preserve. Depending on who you are or who you're representing, your client may be in a certain industry or under federal law or perhaps even under Florida law, 
certain information needs to be kept permanently. So one of the things you need to think about when you're advising your client about using different communications mechanisms is whether or not that's something allowed by, for example, the SEC, dealing with regulated industries, regulated securities industries and the like. Very good question, Judge, thank you. I did not bring that up before and I should have. And as far as the duty to preserve, I think it's fair to say the duty to preserve, as I mentioned before, attaches when you are aware of litigation or you reasonably anticipate litigation. The latter, the easiest thing is I get a letter from someone saying, by the way, I'm going to sue your client because of X, Y, and Z. And we could argue that that wasn't sufficient to put a party on notice or a putative party on notice that there was a duty to preserve that arose. That's a factual determination. It has to be made on an individual basis. But if you know litigation is coming down the road, probably should start preserving. Then the question becomes, what's the scope of the duty to preserve? That's a conversation I have to have with my client as to what do you have? And that's where you talk about communications mechanisms and what's there. I would say more, that, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think that absent, absent a statutory requirement to preserve or to retain either one. For example, if your client happens to be one of the electric power companies in the state, Florida Bar and Light, whatever the other companies are, and there are nuclear um, uh, reg and, and there were no nuclear regulatory preservations. I think that, that you may want to tell that client, um, you have to preserve this stuff forever I, I, and not, not think, oh yeah, you can throw it out after seven years because whatever problems may occur may occur 20, 30, 40 years down the line. Do you agree with that? It depends on the client. It depends on the client, but I don't think because you're in a specific industry, you reasonably anticipate litigation all the time. But I would assume the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has some obligations and record keeping obligations that are imposed on plants. Uh, I know, for example, there was a proposal floating around, I don't know whether it was ever adopted, to require common carriers, airlines, or whatever to keep information on individuals who facial recognition technology for a period of 99 years. So that's industry specific. We need to take a look at that. But there's a perfect example of the difference between an obligation to retain and a duty to preserve. You may have retention obligations imposed on you by law that may or may not intersect with obligations you have imposed on you when you have a duty to preserve. But an example of how they might overlap. If I'm representing a client that has a regulatory obligation to keep something for 10 years, and nine years in, there's litigation, and I have an obligation to preserve it, I can't get rid of the information, although the 10-year retention period has ended, because I'm preserving it for litigation purposes. And that makes it important for you and your client to understand what your retention obligations are, your preservation obligations are, and when you can get rid of information. And by the way, those of you listening in, if you're interested in looking into this in a little more detail with regard to electronic information, uh, Judge Cardone, Ely, and I are both involved in an organization known as the Sedona Conference. It's to me the leading think tank in the country dealing with electronic information and discovery and the like. And if you go to the Sedona Conference website, go to publications, you can download something for free known as the Jumpstart Outline. That's a series of questions you can pose to your client and you can pose to an adversary with regard to electronic information in litigation. So I recommend that to you as a resource. We do not have it in the resource slide at the end. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now I wanna talk about what ephemeral information really may be. And this is the perfect example of what is truly ephemeral. Remember I mentioned before, you may hear something called ephemeral and it may not be depending on settings and the like. This is a decision written a long time ago, now 16 years ago. And this is the question of whether you needed to preserve or a party needed to preserve oscilloscope readings. 
You probably all remember those from science fiction movies, if nothing else. There's a tube, a circular tube, and there are little squiggles that go across it one way or the other. This was a decision written by Magistrate Judge Jay Francis, now retired from the Southern District of New York. Jay's a good friend. He is one of the leading thinkers in the country on electronic information. Uh, the thing that's going back and forth on the tube is a waveform. And you'll notice Judge Francis talks about heroic efforts that have to be kept it. Uh, you have to cease deleting emails, but emails have an existence. And the oscilloscope readings waveforms really don't. So you'll notice judge says no business purposes that they be kept even briefly. And absent a violation of some type of an order, you don't have to keep it. This is a true example of what may be ephemeral. So let's go to the next slide. Now we're getting a little more complicated. Let me, let me, let me, let me make a comment on, on the, uh, one of the disagreements between the parties in that case, and this is an absolute very tiny footnote that dealt with whether the deposition could be taken, uh, the, the judge allowed the deposition to be taken, quote, telephonically, and then there was an objection. No, that did not mean videotape. I'm sure that number one, that required another one or two hour hearing, and it created an incredible amount of attorney's fees. And the judge basically said, yes, you can do it telephonically. And by the way, the party that takes the deposition has the right of how to transcribe it. Um, you can have it videotape, you can have it a uh, court reporter there. Uh, when none of those things existed before that, there were tape recorders. And before that, there were people who wrote stenographically on with a pencil and a pad. So um, number one, make sure that if you are involved in these types of cases that you do the footnote and ask and make sure that you get the ruling at the time instead of having to go back on it because the order indicated that there was some annoyance at having to redo a, a point that was totally very small. And thank you, Judge. I want to talk about electronically stored information now because this has a lot to do whether whether something is ephemeral or not. 2006, the federal rules were amended to address electronic information. And this phrase electronically stored information was introduced. There were some cases back when the rule first went into effect that addressed whether ephemeral information had to be preserved and whether sanctions could be imposed for the loss of that information. This is the leading case that addressed that, Columbia Pictures that came out of the cent Central District of California. And the answer is yes, it is stored. And to understand what stored means, you needed to go into the committee notes that accompanied the 2006 amendment to this rule. And stored basically means the electronic communication was fixed in some type of electronic medium for some period of time. Very broad definition. So going back to the oscilloscope reading, one could probably argue whether that wave function was stored Although considering it wasn't kept, it allowed to run continuously, it might not have been. But I think the answer now is if you have a virtual meeting or you have an ephemeral communication, it is stored within the context or within the meaning of the federal rules of civil procedure and it's subject to a duty to preserve. So we could spend a lot of time talking about this. I think the general answer is it might be stored it might be subject to a duty to preserve, and it might be subject to the imposition of a sanction if it's lost. Next slide, please. Now, I mentioned before this concept of stored. I also mentioned that you need to think about what the ephemeral message is to decide whether it is in fact ephemeral. Now, this came out two months ago. This is from WhatsApp introducing disappearing messages. So there's a functionality 
if it is turned on, chats disappear after seven days. So in other words, the concept is I want to talk to Judge Ely. It's one on one. I don't want other people to see what we're talking about. So I want it to disappear. And the question becomes whether or not one of those chats could be stored within the meaning of the rules. And if it is, can sanctions be imposed for it being lost? Wait, and I, think the, I, I think the answer here is, yeah, it's stored. It's kept for seven days. If you look to the committee note to 34A1, you're going to see that this chat would be deemed to be stored. So if a duty to preserve came up within those seven days, probably something that should be kept. Yes, Judge. Yeah, my question is, was was your was your chat with me because for whatever reason, or you're a lawyer and you have a chat with me, and I'm the presiding judge? That has a totally different. Uh... Well, there are a lot of different things going on. I don't think I would have a duty to preserve a chat with you if I'm communicating with you for purposes of litigation. I don't see how that's relevant to a claim of defense. But if I were communicating with the judicial officer, or for that matter, if I were communicating with the client, I would have serious questions from an ethical point of view about getting rid of that conversation. Right. And you know, this is the rule of self-preservation. So we don't do things that might put us in situations where it might be he said, she said a year from now. I probably want to keep those communications. This, I think, is more if my client is engaging in communicating, I want to have a conversation with my client about how they're communicating. And not only do I want to have a conversation about how they're communicating, I want to have a conversation about how they're keeping it. We don't have time to talk about this today. If you want to have a conversation or you want to look for something about what you can ethically suggest your client do or not do. For example, with social media, this chat might be a form of social media. I'd recommend everyone to go to the New York State Bar Association social media ethics guidelines. Those are available online. The last edition came out in, I believe, 2019. I was the co-chair of the committee that authored those. And you'll see we talk about ethical obligations that attorneys have, for example, when advising clients to use different types of communications mechanisms or to make them private as opposed to getting rid of them. I think it's fair to say the simple answer is if you're talking to your client, you can make things private as long as you keep them if they're subject to a duty to preserve and the like, but you don't advise clients to destroy evidence. I don't know if that answers your question, Judge. Yes. Um, okay. one, of, one of the things that, and I don't know if you were going to reach the case of uh, the Waymo case, or, or is that in your future? Or I'm going to go to those in another minute. Okay, go ahead, and I'll, I'll, I'll hold my comment until then. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Now, here are a couple examples of case law where we've talked about ephemeral messaging. Waymo is a battle about uh, autonomous car technology, easiest way to describe it. And the judge in that case found that uh, the corporation, the defendant, was communicating use of ephemeral messages, also decided that that was a violation of Rule 37E because you had an obligation to preserve that information. Sanctions were warranted because information was not kept. And the judge said, I'm gonna let the jury hear about what's going on here. Case settled before it went to the jury, so we don't know what the instructions would have been. Okay, here, here's, here's what the instruction or here's what the case said. First, the court itself will inform the jury that despite the expedited discovery and provisional relief orders, Uber, who was the defendant, failed to timely disclose the destruction of the five disks and repeatedly supplemented both its communications log and accounting 
after the ordered deadlines. The order, the court will instruct the jury that it may, and it may, it, it need not draw any inference, etc. And I'm sitting there going, this is a perfect example of, of trying to think in the future. How is this going to look at trial? And what is the judge going to do with it? Assuming that the case is not um, that there's no verdict enter against you before it goes to a jury. And that's probably why the case settled. Um, the adverse inference instruction or not, not even an adverse inference instruction, just telling the jury that the court instructs you and it's a matter of law that this defendant destroyed all this evidence after, even after I told them not to. That's there, there's a big debate under the federal rules, under Rule 37E, about what the jury should be told and whether the judge should decide a lot of sanctions questions or they should go to the jury. There are some decisions along this one where a judge said, you know, I'm going to give it to the jury. Let the jury do what it wants with it. Understand this was a permissive instruction, a permissive inference. It wasn't requiring the jury to say you will presume X, Y, and Z. But there's not much guidance that come at, can come out of this decision other than to know if you use ephemeral message communications, they're lost and they should have been preserved. There can be consequences for it. The other decision is Herzig. Herzig came out of Arkansas. Herzig, we have the installation by the plaintiffs of something that was called a communications application designed to disguise and destroy communications. And that was intentional bad face foliation. That raises one big question. If you're using a communications mechanism that's ephemeral, do you have to change and use one that preserves information? Here we had this communications mechanism being used after a duty to preserve a road. So that's something that we as lawyers and judges are going to have to think about someday. The other key to Herzig is it was not a decided under Rule 37E, which is the rule for loss of electronic information, it's decided under the inherent authority of the Western District of Arkansas. And there was summary judgment entered in this case, never went to the jury. So yes, we had a finding of bad faith, but that really doesn't teach us as to what would have happened later on, Judge. There's one more decision I don't have in here that talked about sanctions for use of these different technologies. But I think you get the idea where the judge mentioned this before, we're at the beginning of these technologies. We haven't seen anything I know of with regard to Zoom meeting content or virtual meeting content. I'm sure we will. We're beginning to see some case law on ephemeral messages, but we have a lot to go forward with with this as time goes on. And we're seeing these technologies more and more because of the pandemic. And I think we're going to continue to see them after the pandemic because they're convenient technologies. So, Judge, I don't know if you have any more thoughts on these decisions. One thing that I think is important, and I, I, I think that most of the lawyers who are in the audience, and if anyone has any questions, we have a few minutes left of the program, is that as difficult as your life is with reference to getting depositions, reaching clients, being able to not being able to see a client when uh, or a witness and having to present everything on on the computer i'm aware of of the difficulty of that of litigation today remember that when you then have your motion in court that that judge may or may not be in a courtroom because our courthouses are closed that the judge probably does not have any backup for from the IT department, either present in court or available. A lot of times we just have to call the person on the phone on the other line. To give you a, a very tiny example, um, over the weekend I worked uh, first appearance hearings and unfortunately, my sign-on credentials were not recognized because I was in a different courthouse. I had to call the administrative judge of that division and had to sign in through her credentials. So 
remember that the technology that we're working with is is in most cases, although my the Eleventh Circuit is quite um, has a great technology and it, it's very uh, up to date, but you may not be working with judges who have the kind of backup that you have in your practice. So uh, make allotments for more time, read the rules, and stay safe. Judge Ely raises an excellent point that when you're using these technologies, I mentioned before confidence and the duty to supervise. You have to have someone you can depend on since you probably don't know how to use all these technologies yourself to assist you if something goes wrong or you have a problem with it. And in addition to that, you have to realize we're dealing with new technologies. There are new apps coming out regularly, both for virtual meetings and for ephemeral messages. And you have to familiarize yourself to some degree with what these technologies are. You either learn about them yourself or you associate yourself with someone who can talk to you about it. And with that, let's go to the next slide. Some resources for you in your materials that are provided to you by the State Bar in addition to these slides, you'll see an article that I co-authored last month talking about virtual meeting platforms and ephemeral apps. It goes into more detail from what we were talking about today. We also have an article written 12 years ago now about ephemeral data, but this derived from the 2006 amendments to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and the question of what stored means. And then last, just a link to a blog that I think very excellently talks about self-deleting apps in the employer-employee context. And with that, I don't see any questions. Judge, I don't know if you have any closing comments. If you want to give some, go ahead, and then I will, and then we'll turn it back to the bar. I do thank all of you for attending, and I thank the Florida Bar, and the Florida Bar has done a very good job of keeping uh, or trying to keep up with what is happening today and what might happen tomorrow. And with that, I want to thank everyone for being with us today. And again, thank Jonathan and the Florida Bar for having us. Thank you. Jonathan, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts. No, I think it was a great presentation. And you know, seeing that there's no questions, it seems like you guys uh, you know, covered it all very well. So again, you know, thank everybody for attending today. Uh, once again, in case you need it, the course number was 4473. Again, that's 4473, and you will need to go to the Florida Bar website and post those credits yourself. And we will be sending out a link to the recording for anybody who wants to rewatch this presentation. I just want to thank uh, Ron and Judge Ely again, Eric Cardone Ely. I appreciate your time, and everybody have a good day. Thank you, everyone.